So we're here at King's College in intro, um, entrepreneurial journalism class, and we're so glad to have a guest speaker, Dave Gehring from the West Coast today. And uh, David, if you could tell us a bit about your background and how you got into entrepreneurship. Yeah, well, I, I share the Christian college background. I went to Westmont uh, as an undergraduate majoring in philosophy, um, graduated in the early 90s. And, uh, and I was, you know, I chose philosophy largely because I wanted to stay away from anything remotely practical um, during my uh, liberal arts college undergraduate experience and completely succeeded in that because right after college, I ended up um, working as a youth pastor at a couple of Presbyterian churches and up at a um, Christian conference center in the mountains of Southern California for a while before um, moving to the Bay Area originally to be the youth pastor at a Presbyterian church in Berkeley um, before jumping into the tech industry. And uh, which was a pretty um, uh, tumultuous transition, um, having studied philosophy at a Christian liberal arts college and then trying to get into the tech industry and not really knowing what any of that meant or what anybody did. Um, so I spent a lot of years actually doing enterprise software startups, um, working as the business development guy, which is basically like a salesperson um, for, uh, for a variety of enterprise software companies. And then realized um, I wanted to get closer to the consumer. Um, so I started doing some internet startups. And uh, living here in San Francisco, in the heart of Silicon Valley, um, there was just no shortage of opportunities to try and navigate the startup landscape. Um, and then uh, long story short, um, I, uh, I ended up joining um, uh, YouTube as my first job at Google. Um, I guess uh, 2009, 2010, with a premise that had been kind of developing in my mind for some time. I had been engaging with local media companies, pr primarily local newspapers or TV stations, because of the work that I was doing previously. And in that, in that interaction, I was beginning to realize that the economics of the news industry was suffering. And, uh, and, and we were, as a society, um, moving towards uh, effectively defunding the exercise of journalism at societal scale because of the transition from a digital media econ from a traditional media economy to a digital media economy. And this stressed me out like crazy um, because I thought if we don't have companies in the world that pay journalists to do journalism, then we won't have a functioning democracy or a civil society. Um, so I thought I'm gonna save journalism. <laughs> Because, <laughs> you know, every career needs a mission, <laughs> or at least it's a lot more fun if it has a mission. Um, otherwise, it's just good to make a living. But, uh, but I really wanted a mission to animate and accelerate my career. And so my mission was to focus on the economics of the journalism space. And so my first job really focusing on that was to start the news partnerships team at YouTube um, back in the day. Um, after a couple of years, of working at YouTube, I realized that YouTube specifically wasn't going to be material in the economics of the news industry. Um, and I wasn't in a position um, in my, my role there to change that. So I shifted over to a strategy team at Google that gave me um, an opportunity to look across all of Google's product areas and think a lot about what could Google do differently that might improve the economic opportunity for quality original journalism on the open web. And because of the position that I was in on this strategy team at Google, um, that, and that gave me the opportunity to look across a lot of different aspects of Google's um, work, you know, on the, in the web economy, I started zeroing in on some fundamental problems that, uh, that I thought needed to be solved in order for the news industry to have a better market opportunity in the medium of the open web. And I think that's probably the first thing that if you haven't written anything down, write this one down. When you're starting something up, know what the problem is that you're trying to solve. And that's sometimes the hardest thing to know. Um, a lot of people start up companies because they want to run their own thing. They want, they want what they believe to be some feeling of independence. None of that stuff is, is, uh, is true. Um, so I know running my own company, I don't feel independent. I feel 
like I, my role is to serve my team. And I feel like my role is to serve the problem that I'm trying to solve for society. But really the most important thing when you're starting something up is having a clear eyed understanding and view on what is the problem that you're trying to solve. And then the second thing is who, who has that problem? Like a really clear eyed view of who is the customer or what is the constituency or what is the market that this problem is most acute. So the problem that I zeroed in on was the fact that it's really hard to share content on the open web. Because of the way web technologies have evolved over the last 30 years, it made it so that it was easy to actually put content on a website, but it was difficult to have that same content be rendered on other people's websites in a way that maintained the original producer's control. This had significant economic implications because if you don't have control over how your content is, is used on websites that you don't operate, then your business opportunity in this medium is inherently limited. Now, if you were to have control over how your business um, is reflected in your content on other people's websites, then you have an inherently un, unlimited scalable opportunity in terms of leveraging the open web in a way that is more native to its decentralized architecture as a technology. Um, maybe I'll stop there for a second and see, does that make sense so far? Everybody tracking? I'm getting nods of yes. Yeah, I mean, to, to drill into that a little bit more, because it's, it's never a waste of time to, to know deeply about the problem that you're trying to solve. So the web was launched about 31 years ago by this guy named Sir Tim Berners-Lee, a British um, computer scientist. And he launched the, the web as a communication medium that was layered on top of the internet infrastructure that was this global um, global communication infrastructure that was originally developed by um, the US military for the sake of military applications like 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Um, he, he launched the web on top of the internet and he launched what was effectively a decentralized network. The web was designed to propagate information across the nodes, which in this case would be domains or websites. It was never actually designed to aggregate audience or users to individual nodes. It was built with the assumption that everyone interacting with the web was going to be fundamentally distributed because of the fundamental decentralized architecture of the medium. So for the last 20 years, media companies have been applying traditional media business models to this new medium, the web. But those traditional media business models require audience aggregation, which again was fundamentally opposed to the natural behavior of a decentralized network. So as a result, media companies were having a really hard time figuring out how to make money in this medium. And I thought one of the reasons why it's so difficult is because there was no syndication technology that made it easy to distribute content across this decentralized architecture. And so one of the things that I thought was gonna be really important in order for the industry of the news media to more effectively harness this new medium of the open web was we were gonna to need to create new technologies to enable new forms of media business models that were more native to the design of this medium that they wanted to do business in. And one of those technologies was some way to syndicate content to the open web. And by syndicate, I mean, take my content, like the, 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 the words of an article, the, the colors, the shapes, and the business, so like the ads and the analytics and the paywalls, whatever's on that article, and have that be something that can be distributed efficiently and infinitely across the entire open web. Now that technology didn't exist. And so I thought, well, this is an opportunity um, 
so this is the second the second fundamental lesson is is the is the problem that I'm trying to solve solvable as a startup company or is it a public policy um, strategy that I should pursue? Get governments to actually regulate things differently? Or is it something that a big company is in a position to do, but a small company would never actually have the opportunity to pursue? Should it be a for-profit company? Is there a business model for, for this solution? Or should it be a nonprofit where I try and raise donations and philanthropic foundation financing to fund this thing. So these are all, so the first question is, what's the problem that I'm trying to solve? And then the second question is, what's the right form of organization, for-profit, nonprofit, big company, startup, government? What's the right organization to try and solve that problem? Because a lot of problems actually don't aren't solved by starting up a company. A lot of problems are solved by pursuing government regulation. A lot of problems are solved by um, by convincing large companies to 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 do things. Um, the problem that I was trying to solve at that point was how do I get the world to um, embrace a new web development framework that would allow for contents to be syndicated efficiently across the open web. Well, the first problem is how do I how do I build that? So I thought you know Google should do this right because I worked at Google and uh, it's a big company. They've got a lot of engineers that uh, everybody tells me are super smart, and so uh, I thought I'm going to get Google to do this. But I couldn't get Google to do anything because I'm not an engineer. I was just a strategy guy. I studied philosophy at a Christian college. They're never going to pay any attention to me, <laughs> and so I left Google. Um, I went to work for The Guardian because the CEO of The Guardian, which is this you know, um, news, news, news organization in, in, in London, the CEO of The Guardian uh, let me pull together this coalition of European news media companies, including Financial Times, Les Echo in France, El Pais in Spain, um, La Stampa, um, or El Pais in yeah, Spain, La Stampa in Italy, um, a couple in Germany, FAZ and Die Zeit and uh, NRC in the Netherlands and a couple others. We pulled together this coalition of news media companies and then we decided let's, let's go talk to Google as a, as a coalition of the news media industry and let's see if they'll um, help us out and, uh, and launch a, what effectively would be an open source software project to define a new global standard for content syndication on the web. This worked a lot better um, because we had a lot of, on the publisher side of the table, we had a lot of political influence in the EU and Google didn't have any. Um, and so we said, we'll help you out with uh, some of your um, problems in the, you know, in the political space in the EU, if you help us out with some of these new technologies. And so Google ended up leading the launch of an open source software project to define a global standard for content syndication. Now, you know, I wanted Google to do this when I worked at Google. I couldn't get Google to do it when I worked there. So I had to leave and I had to kind of marshal some uh, political um, uh, leverage to get Google to do this. So we ended up launching um, this open source project, which then became known as the AMP project. And fast forward to today, AMP as a web development framework represents about 30% of all the web pages you might ever encounter on the web. So that took off. Now, from an entrepreneurship perspective, that took off as an open source software project that was being led by a massive multinational, you know, multinational global corporation in Google. Not something a startup could pull off. Um, but now that the world was actually adopting this new um, way of publishing content to the web, now I could, I could start up a company that took advantage of this new market reality and tried to solve the original problem, which was how to provide a better market opportunity for quality content on this medium of the open web. So the first step was establish a new technology that the whole world would adopt. And I did that with a nonprofit open source software project led by the most powerful technology company in the world. And then once that was really achieving some market penetration, 
then I could start another company that would be a for-profit technology Silicon Valley startup that harnesses this new market dynamic to create new business models for media companies. Um, and so the, the first step was, you know, get, the, get this project launched, um, then get the world to adopt it. Part of the strategy for getting the world to adopt it was um, I did start another company that was really just an amp converter technology where I would work with local news publishers across North America and help them convert their old websites into this new web framework. A month shy of two years, our two year anniversary, I sold that company to Google in 2017. And then that freed me up to start the company that I've got now, which is Distributed Media Lab. Um, now, Distributed Media Lab is still focused on that same problem I've been focused on for the last 10 years, but finally now have the opportunity to just focus on that problem from the perspective of a startup that is a conventional um, venture financeable um, technology company in the Silicon Valley kind of model. And so what I did with Distributed Media Lab <clears throat> is I had to get a new, a new co-founder because my old team all now works for Google. Um, so I partnered up with a friend um, who was this, the chief technology officer at uh, Bleacher Report. I don't know if any of you guys ever use Bleacher Report for sports. Um, so he was at Bleacher Report the whole time. They sold that company to CNN. And uh, he and I had been talking about how we're going to fix the web someday for like 10 or 15 years, but it was usually just over beer. And, uh, and so finally, the opportunity um, came for us to work together. So we launched Distributed Media Lab um, at, in the early 2018. And, uh, and for the first two and a half years, we, um, we built a lot of fun stuff. Um, and we worked with a lot of media companies and it was kind of a, a way of experimenting with different ways to leverage um, AMP as a syndication format for new, new forms of distribution that would open up new business models. And, um, and then a couple of years into it, we got um, a couple million dollars from a grant or organization to, um, uh, to support a new uh, reader revenue technology that was being um, proposed as a, an open standard um, web technology. And, um, and so then we started hiring people and then we started building businesses that could um, benefit from this distribution platform that we had um, created. The first business that we built was uh, really focused on local news because you know going back to the mission of trying to um, uh, support journalism, um, the, the probably the, the, the companies that are the most adversely impacted by all of this um, economic transition over the last 10 years has been local news publishers. Um, and so, uh, so like when you, when you try and solve a problem, you try and figure out who's got the worst version of that problem and it's local news. Um, and so, uh, so we started working with local news publishers to, um, to provide them a, uh, uh, a variety of things that they could do using our distribution platform that would help them sit, um, sell more advertising or shore up their reader revenue within their local markets. And now we're actually expanding um, the use of the platform to um, include, we work with a lot of um, journalism collaboratives uh, where um, uh, you know, a lot of independent news organizations want to collaborate on journalism with regards to a particular topic like climate change or healthcare or, um, or uh, democracy or voting rights, things like that. And so then we, as a distribution platform, make it really easy for them to actually share their content with one another um, using our, our, our specifications in, in, um, in the platform. So we work with local media to open up some new businesses for them um, in their local local markets. We work with journalism collaboratives to facilitate the sharing of content across collaborative journalism projects. And now we're actually, as of this week, launching um, another business on top of the platform that enables brands and um, agencies that represent big you know, advertising brands to distribute their content marketing content to a large audience using um, the advertising infrastructure of the web. All three of these different use cases, like the, the, the local news business use, use case or the collaborative journalism use case or the brand 
content distribution use case are all using the same underlying platform that we had built. And so it, uh, it, it just allows us to leverage that technology in a variety of ways with a goal to build a business that we hope is going to be worth more than a billion dollars someday soon, but with towards a mission that is focused on establishing a more viable economic framework to support quality original journalism on the web. Now, the mission is really important because um, uh, unlike when I graduated from college, you guys are graduating into an extremely um, fun economy for finding a job. Um, it is really, really, um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of jobs out there right now and, and us employers are competing fiercely um, for hiring uh, the best people we can find. Um, and so one of the strategies that we have, fortunately, is the fact that, um, you know, if, if you've got two jobs that pay you the same amount, it's going to basically be the exact same kind of lifestyle economically, but one of them has a mission that makes you feel good about what you're doing in the world, and the other one doesn't. Um, we're finding that your generation actually likes to actually have a mission. <laughs> Now, I've always felt that way, but you know, my practical friends from my generation always thought I was a little bit crazy, a little bit of an activist. Um, and I was like, well, it's because of my Catholic mom. You know, I'm, I'm a bit of an activist. Um, but fortunately, um, your generation is, is totally into doing whatever it can to try and make the world a better place. And so that's been helping us tremendously as, as a company that really wants to just bring on people that are interested in, and able to commit to the mission that we're pursuing, which is let's fix the economics of journalism so that we can have a society with an industry that employs more journalists because we need those people working as journalists to hold power accountable so that we can maintain democracy and a civil society. Um, and so that's really, that's really our goal. Now, one, one of the, the mission around journalism is very specific. Like we want to improve the economics for that industry. And, and the reason for that is obvious because it's fundamental to democracy. But more broadly, we need to actually improve the way the economics of the web work in general. Because the open web is a technology that the world uses to communicate with itself in a way that is increasingly foundational to healthy societies and economies, as well as democracy. And the open web is right now under significant threat. And by what I, what I mean by that is a natural law of uh, technology or business or the intersection of technology and business is consolidation or centralization. Like when you have something that is decentralized, like the open web, you have economic incentives to try and control as much of that decentralized network as possible through a central authority. That's the natural progression of an economic incentive on an open market. And so we have examples of that. So for instance, Facebook is the easiest um, to point to as, as an organization that has centralized the ability to interact with a large audience. And in doing so, they've effectively become probably the world's biggest example of what's referred to as a walled garden. That walled garden structure within an otherwise decentralized network effectively um, uh, uh, kind of um, cloisters off the web in a way that makes it less open and, um, and more easily controlled by power rather than something that can be used to hold power accountable. So from, from our perspective, we're huge fans of what's referred to as the open web, um, which is um, basically like the opposite of what Facebook does um, as a walled garden. And so what we're trying to do is basically build the technologies that support a robust economic framework for the open web. And the, the best example of that in, in some specific use case has to do with journalism. Um, 
And so that's what we're up to. Um, you know, I can tell you a little bit about how um, I think one of the things that I have done with this class in the past is talk about how um, how we're financed as a startup. Um, and uh, sometimes that's interesting when you're thinking about doing a startup, like how do you fund it? Um, and uh, but I think, you know, generally speaking, um, pick a problem that's a really big, hard problem that has a really big audience or market that needs to have that problem solved and then go from there. So, but that's, uh, I mean, how does that work for, for an intro? And then we can take some questions. I, yeah, that, that's a great intro. And, and I do think, um, I, you know, it would be great to hear how you're, how you're financed or funded and um, uh, how many employees you had. You said you've been hiring, it sounds like. Uh, maybe tell us a little, a little bit about the funding and the operations. Yeah, so we um, so for the first two and a half years or so, it was just me and my co-founder, and I, I I would refer to Distributed Media Lab more as our hobby that I had some friends give me money to do for a living, than um, than a business at that point or a company. Um, we had raised, um, you know, for the first two and a half years, we had raised um, about a little over a million dollars in um, a convertible notes. So convertible notes are technically debt. Um, I don't know how much um, how much have you guys learned about different financing vehicles for startups at this point? We haven't done much on that. We've done some on funding rounds and types okay. of funding, but not so much on the on the, those vehicles. Okay. Yeah. So the convertible note is going to be a typical vehicle for a pre-seed financing round. And um, as a tech startup, you know, of the Silicon Valley kind of model. Um, you're going to raise a little bit of money um, in that pre-seed round, typically through convertible notes or through what's referred to now as a safe uh, agreement, which is effectively the same sort of thing. And these are these are actually technically debt instruments. So you're telling an investor that in return for their hundred thousand dollars of investment they're actually buying debt in your company. And so as debt, it'll have an interest rate that will accrue to the principal over time. And then since it's called a convertible note, that debt plus the principal that has accrued will convert into equity when you do your first equity round, which is typically going to be your seed or series A. So for the first phase, you're just raising money by selling debt. And then that debt converts into equity when you raised your first equity round. So for us, we raised a little bit over a million um, through rolling convertible notes over a two and a half, three year period. And then um, in 2020, um, we, or in 2021, we actually raised our first um, equity round where we added another, maybe a little over a million, maybe one and a half million of new money and converted the million of convertible notes into the equity. So the total round was about two and a half million as our pre, as and that was technically our seed round. Now, when you raise money um, in an equity round, you have to set a valuation. Um, and so the valuation basically determines what percentage of the company you're actually selling in return for the money that you've raised. And so for us, um, I think we did a pre-seed, uh, we did a seed pre-money valuation of like 12 million or so. And so our post money, so like the value of the company after we've done the round, um, the post money valuation would be like 15 million. So now you're off the races because um, the goal, the goal at this point from now on is to just have a larger and larger and larger valuation every single time you raise money. Um, and, uh, and so you try and raise money in a way that is always keeping an eye on what is the round going to look like after the next round you do, because you want to make sure that you don't lock yourself into a growth requirement trajectory that is un, un, you know, unrealistic. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you're trying to raise money, um, selling equity at a valuation that uh, keeps you as the entrepreneur and your employees who have common shares happy. And so we raised money. Um, we started hiring people. So um, we're at 11 people in the company right now. Um, and the goal for right, and we went from two to 11 in about a year. 
um, maybe a year and a half. And so I spent a lot of my time basically just interviewing people um, and trying to recruit people that I always wanted to be part of my company if ever I had some reason to hire them kind of a thing. And, um, and so now we're at about 11 and, uh, and we'll probably stay there for a few months as we see how does the revenue start to grow. And then we'll target hiring again, probably the end of this year as we roll into the end of the year or the new year when we raise um, the next round of financing, which would be our Series A. So, um, but yeah, yeah, so that's where I, we're at. Yeah, I've kind of heard the rule of thumb that uh, in, in any funding round, try not to give over more than 10% of equity. Is that sounds about where you're at too, huh? Yeah, that's that's a good rule of thumb. Um, I think that sometimes depending on your idea, like some ideas cost a lot of money to actually bring to market. Some ideas shouldn't cost a lot of money to bring to market. Um, if it doesn't cost a lot of money to bring it to market, like we're not, it's not a hardware thing. It's not a um, pharmaceutical drug. It's not um, biotechnology. It's just a software application on the web. Then, um, then yeah, I think that's a great rule of thumb. If it's something like um, like a, a new pharmaceutical drug or a biotech or um, something that costs a lot of money to launch, then um, you're typically going to be selling a lot a higher percentage of the company for in the earlier rounds, uh, but you'll be raising a lot more money. Um, and so for us, you know, being a web technology, it's it's really not expensive to do what we're doing. It's just um, really a function of the fact that we know what we're doing more than anybody else. And we're trying to achieve scale as a defensible position uh, before anybody else. And so it's just speed. It's just how fast can you move? Um, I think a lot of VCs, like conventional um, uh, um, venture capital firms for a pre-seed round will say that they want to buy 20% of the company in that pre-seed round. That's usually like they're just opening line um, and then they kind of expect the founders to say, how about 5%? And then you meet somewhere in the middle. <laughs> and uh, so, but it's always, it's, it's always a negotiation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing I, I want to make sure that the class and, and I understand is um, you, the product you're selling. And now that you have, it sounds like two, one, two, three products coming out. Um, how are you selling it? I mean, what you guys are learning about getting it out to the customers, because that I find is the super hard part too yeah. um, for entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think um, if, if, one of the big, if one of the big points is know the problem that you're trying to solve, and then the next point is know the market that you're trying to solve it for, then the third one that kind of sits at the very top of that heap of important things is know how are you going to bring it to market? Because uh, I think a lot of investors are, are savvy enough to know that the best idea in the world developed by the smartest engineer in the world who has no way of knowing how to get the world to use that solution is worthless. So from a route to market perspective, you know, our first entry was to engage with the local news media industry, which is um, incredibly disaggregated. And, um, and, and, and you're talking about working with like a local newspaper where um, it's, it takes a lot of time to, uh, that results in very, 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 very small economic activity. So, so, then, so it was really important to us to figure out, well, how do we access a lot of these in a very efficient way um, so that we could try and build some sort of affinity collective of local newspapers that we could engage with um, in a more efficient way and, um, and kind of approach the market that way. So here's where um, having lots and lots of, year, of years in the industry is extremely helpful because I have this reputation in the industry that I've been working on for like 15 or 20 years because of the work that I was doing at YouTube and Google and at The Guardian and all this stuff. And so I have really good personal relationships with industry associations like the local media association and the local media consortium where I can engage with those, those associations and I can say, hey, I want to interact with your 4,000 members, but I wanna do it through a program that you guys run so I don't have to hire 500 business development people. 
And so we actually launched our first um, uh, entry into the local news market in partnership with the local media association and the local media consortium. And, uh, and here is the fun, the fun Jedi mind trick um, is we got Facebook to fund the whole thing. <laughs> and so the first couple of years was all Facebook money um, doing the same I'm doing other projects with the local media association where we get Google to give money to the local media association that then they end up giving us to power everything technically. And, uh, and so that does a couple things. One is, you know, when I get cash from, you know, filtered through uh, the, the industry associations from, um, you know, big wallets like Google and Facebook, it de-risks the, um, the development for me as I you know, pay engineers to build things. And it incentivizes my industry association partners to promote the availability of these solutions to all of their constituent members, which is the entire industry. And they have already kind of established those routes of communication through webinars and email newsletters. And everybody's just already looking to these associations for news about what's going on in the industry. And so for us, in order for it to be even remotely viable that we would be doing anything for the local news industry, we really needed to make sure that we had an extremely robust partnership with the industry associations that would then end up helping with marketing and promotion of the solutions that we were building. And then it turned out that we could also use them to launder money from Google and Facebook because um, there's so much of that going around these days. And so, uh, so that's been really, really helpful. But roots to market, very important. So associations and partnerships is, some, guys, this is very good to think about um, who your partners and are there associations you can work with like that. Um, there's also so many tools coming out, like everybody seems to be talking about, I find HubSpot, um, uh, so for startups before they get to, you know, needing Salesforce, HubSpot's popular also, um, I mean, Notion is kind of popular, but also um, I, I was recently saw a demo of a company called Seamless AI. So gaining customers using those kind of tools. Does that apply to your business or not as much? Some of these not really. Of like we're 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 probably going to be using HubSpot to power our website and largely because they also have a CRM. So then as we get customers, we can keep them organized in a database that HubSpot provides. But HubSpot's not going to bring us any customers. Um, and I've always been a little bit suspicious of platforms that say they're going to bring me customers um, just because in, in our industry, um, there's no software platform that's going to convince the publisher of a local newspaper to work with me. That's just the market that we're in. In other markets, like if you're trying to sell something to a consumer, like a skincare product or something like that, then maybe... Um, uh, there are platforms that would actually facilitate the marketing of those those offerings to a large consumer audience. But we're we're really a B two B or an enterprise play in terms of we work with media companies. Those are our partners and and customers, and then they use our platform to power advertising solutions or reader revenue offerings to their customers, which are local advertisers or consumers. So it's really, uh, yeah, I've never been able to find a, a, an easier way to engage with the industry other than through just really long standing, deeply trusted relationships. Mm -hmm. Which I guess maybe that's the fourth lesson. Like um, as you work out your career, never ever underestimate the value of establishing long-standing deeply trusted relationships based on a well-regarded reputation um, your the yeah. reputation that you build in your in your career is everything they never ever compromise that so absolutely